and welcome to Penmanship, a podcast about Australian writing culture. I'm your host, Andrew McMillan. Before I introduce today's guest, I want to take a few moments to talk about the last episode, featuring my interview with John Birmingham. I had some feedback from listeners to tell me that the audio quality was so poor that they couldn't finish the episode. Two things. First of all, that sucks, and I'm really sorry that that happened. There was a problem with microphone placements, which I have learned a lot from since. Secondly, I know how you feel, because I had a similar experience with one of my favorite podcasts recently, Waking Up with Sam Harris. He released an episode where he interviewed a person via Skype, and the audio quality was terrible, and after a few minutes, I gave up. So I understand where you're coming from. I apologize for the poor audio quality in episode three. I'd encourage you to go back and listen to the episode if you can uh, try to ignore the whirring laptop fan in the background because John Birmingham is a man who has a lot to offer and anyone interested in building a career out of writing has a lot to learn from what he has to say. Today's guest is Matthew Condon and I'm pleased to report that the audio quality is back to my usual high standards. Matthew Condon is a man who, like John Birmingham, can alternate between writing fiction and non-fiction with apparent ease. I first met Matthew in 2010 when I interviewed and profiled him for the Weekend Australian Review around the release of his excellent book Brisbane, which offered a unique and literary insight into the city where he grew up and in more recent years returned to while raising his young family. Matthew is an acclaimed fiction writer who was first published in 1988 with The Motorcycle Café, a novel inspired by his experiences working at a petrol station. I'm less familiar with his fiction writing, though I thoroughly recommend his 1998 novel The Pillow Fight, which is about an abusive relationship written from the perspective of the male victim. In recent years, his journalistic work has taken prominence. Matthew is an associate editor at the Queensland newspaper The Courier Mail and a staff writer at QE Kend, where he was also editor for a year or so, and during that time he kindly published several stories of mine. In 2013, the first in Matthew's trilogy of diligently researched non-fiction books about the Queensland Police was published by University of Queensland Press. Three Crooked Kings was followed by Jacks and Jokers in 2014, and the final chapter is due later this year. I can't wait, the first two are unmissable for anyone who has the slightest interest in Queensland history. My interview with Matthew took place at the News Queensland offices in Bowen Hills in late April. At my suggestion, we found a disused office in a quiet corner of the building. It may have been the very same room where I interviewed Trent Dalton in the first episode of Penmanship. As a long-time admirer of his work, it was a privilege to pick Matthew's brain about the craft of writing and to hear what propelled him into a career of working with words. Our conversation touches on an intimate and unforgettable story about visiting his grandmother in a psychiatric ward one Christmas as a young man, which he later wrote about in his short story collection The Lulu Magnet in 1996. His parents' disappointment at his decision to pursue a career as a writer, and how it's only in the last few years with the success of Three Crooked Kings that they have started to realise his talent and impact his job working at a petrol station, and what he learned about human nature by the way that customers tended to treat him in that role, what he learned from his stint editing Q.E. Kend, and the personal difficulties he has faced while writing his recent books about the Queensland Police. Introducing Matthew Condon, author and staff writer at Q.E. Kend. Condon, welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Good to be here. You've had a fairly remarkable career, and I've only known you for a few years, but I've, so I've kind of caught the tail end of your career, and we will go back to the beginning during this interview. Yeah. But for now, I wondered if you could give us a snapshot of what's happening right now in your career. At this very moment, um, as of April, what is it, 22, um, I'm in the final 100 pages of the edit of the third volume of my trilogy of true crime books on the life and times of Terry Lewis. Um, This wraps up the series, although what has come out of this five and a half year project is um, a number of other potential projects if I 
uh, uh, decide to take them on. But um, it's been I've been to hell and back in five and a half years to get this done, and um, um, we're almost there. The end is, is in sight. It is in sight. It is in sight, and um, uh, parallel to to this, in the lead up to the publication of this final volume, there's been a lot of um, disturbing behaviour behind the scenes. Uh, it's something that I I, I, I was expecting, um, but not to the degree that it's been happening, and um, it's just a matter of um, grinning and bearing it. Hmm. Yeah, we'll come back to that trilogy sure. later on, but uh, at the outset, I'll just say that anyone listening who hasn't picked up Three Crooked Kings, Jackson Jokers, or the forthcoming volume, All Fall Down, I All believe. Fall Down, but that may change that title, okay. and negotiating that. Absolutely crucial reading for anyone with an interest in Queensland's history, political history, and the intersection with the police force. Absolutely great. Thank you. All right. Matt, were you drawn to writing as a child? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I was born into a house with very few books, really, to be frank. Uh, having said that, my father, who trained initially as an industrial chemist and then went into the banking sector as a teller, uh, he actually attempted, I only found this out years later, he started writing a novel in his early 20s and n- nothing came of it. But um, I was writing, writing down stuff from when I was about eight. Hmm. Where do you think that creativity came from? I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've asked that question of myself for years and I wonder, is there any purpose in asking it? But um, certainly I had a very uh, talented and artistic grandfather who, well, he died when I was uh, eight months old, so I never technically got to meet him. But, um, you know, I've been told through my life that ha- how much I resemble him and Certainly in my attitude to life, artistic um, inclination, um, appearance. So, uh, in, and it was out of that mystery of this man that came, in fact, came my first book, The Motorcycle Cafe. So it was an attempt to understand him, to try and bring him back to life hmm. um, for myself. Mm. You have siblings? I've got a twin sister. Does she work in a creative field? No, absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Um she doesn't at all, and uh, you know we, we couldn't be in many ways more opposite. Um, but obviously, without um, being cliched, the twin thing is a pretty powerful connection, you know. Mm. What did your parents make of your desire to be a writer? When did you first start making that known to? Oh, I think um, you know. I think um, it was evident from my uh, early to mid teens that. Um, that was the direction I chose. Uh, they, I think, my parents viewed it as a sort of quaint um, hobby and distraction that um, that I would wake up from and pursue something uh, more concrete and real mm. and uh, lucrative. And um, and um, indeed, uh, I'd published several books. Uh, and my mother said to me, "When are you going to um, drop this hobby?" Wow. So, you know, they're from that era whereby um, what's real is to be a lawyer or a doctor or whatever. And, um, but there was no choice for me. It was preordained and it was what I would do. Ah, so there was never any inkling of pursuing other non-writing work? Absolutely not. Oh, wow. No. What was your first paying job? What was the first thing you did to earn money? Ah, what did I do? I... I um, collected trolleys for Kmart. I worked disastrously in their home improvement section <laughs> yeah. um, on a Saturday, charged with mixing um, house paint for young couples and getting the colours wrong. And it was a nightmare. And um, but then I went to uni, and um, I did a lot of free work for local little local new, newspapers and spent the bulk of my um, annual holidays from uni um, working for no pay at the Gold Coast Bulletin. Mm. And um, when I graduated, there were, the, the media was, um, it was in a bit of a dire straits and there were no jobs. So I worked um, 
pumping petrol in a service station for about 12 months hmm. until a position came up on the Gold Coast Bulletin. Let's take a few steps back. What were you like as a student, a high school student? I was very um, dedicated. Um, you know, if I, was tol- if I was told to hand in a 10-page English assignment, I would hand in a 70-page English assignment. So, um, you know, I loved, I loved school and I worked very hard. And, um, yeah, I was not a reckless, feckless, angry teenager. Hmm. You grew up in Brisbane? Yeah, I grew up in Brisbane until we, I was about 14. And then um, because of business opportunities for my father, we moved to the Gold Coast. Hmm. And um, I spent uh, three and a half to four very long years down there. Huh. Um, it was just a foreign landscape to me and I never grafted to it. Both of those locations have figured prominently in your writing, though. Um, you've written beautifully about Brisbane in a book named Brisbane, published, I think it was five years ago. Could you just give us a snapshot of what you recall of your childhood? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think um, I was very solitary in that um, I, I had absolutely no problem with um, enjoying my own company. Hmm. And indeed, it was a different era whereby you were encouraged to um, explore and to to invent and 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 use the time um, for yourself, as opposed to you know I have my own young children and uh, everything is delivered on screens and tablets and um, there's no necessity to create and invent for yourself. Hmm. So. Um, because I was happy with my own company, riding and playing and um, bicycling, and um, um, I, I think I had a very tactile childhood in terms of understanding or exploring the environment, my immediate environment. And um, you know, you'd go, you'd camp, and you'd build fires, and you'd cook food, and uh, uh, and you'd do things that kids today would find abhorrent and dull and mm-hmm. um, incomprehensible. Mm. So um, there was that. And, you know, I had a very, very close relationship with my grandmother on my mother's side. And that she was the, um, she was the wife of my grandfather, George, who I was telling you about. Mm. And um, she was a brilliant storyteller. And uh, she... She was a very working class person. She would tell me stories of her and her husband campaigning for, for example, Manford Cross, the great labor figure in the 1960s. And um, my grandfather, who was a sign writer, um, donated his services to painting um, election placards for the ALP. And, mm. um, so, you know, she was a very, very grounded person a real person. She was a cleaner, for example, for the society ladies of Brisbane. And she would tell me the stories of these women and um, and their lives as she saw it. And so I had a wonderful and warm relationship with her. Um, mm. And she too had um, some mental health issues that stemmed back through this particular female line of my family. And that those stories, even as a, a young child, I appreciated that there was something amiss, and um, um, they fascinated me and, and appalled me, and um, gave me great empathy hmm. for her. And um, her story, you know, in many ways was so sad in terms of, um, you know, this is the way they dealt with things. When my mother was born in 1940, for example, my grandmother had postnatal depression. And of course, the the solution then was to put her straight into the Goodna um, mental institution, where she spent the, f- the first six months of my mother's life. She was in there as an inmate, hmm. and what stemmed from that was a life lifetime of problems with her mental health, uh, leading up to electro shock treatment and all sorts of stuff, uh, attempted suicide. Um, it's fascinating that I've, I've, I have a grandmother and a great grandmother um, who both um, attempted suicide 
One was successful. She drowned herself in Brisbane in the 1950s. Mm. So it's interesting to look at that as a, as, a, as a child and to see how I'm still trying to answer those questions. Mm. Um, and in many ways, writing, in a simplistic way, writing is, is, a, is a way to, to solve the puzzles, um, yeah. to reach in and try and work it out. Well, you wrote about your grandmother in your story collection, The Lulu Magnet. There's a chapter called Ticking. Yes. Tell us a bit about Ticking. Ticking was, um, it stemmed from an incident whereby I, um, uh, my grandmother was in, uh, locked, uh, locked up in the notorious um, Ward B in the Royal Brisbane Hospital. And it was approaching Christmas time and my mother, uh, I was home in Queensland at the time and my mother said, let's go and visit you. What, you, age, what age would you have been at that time? Gee, I would have been maybe in my late 20s. Mm. And uh, she said, let's go and visit your grandmother. And so we went up there and um, she was this, you know, sad and frail figure in a ward full of uh, young people who would, who would slash themselves and try to take their own lives. And here was this elderly lady sitting quiet and frightened in a chair. And uh, the nurse came up and, and, and said, um, look, this is the Christmas Day um, lunch menu. Could you help? Could you fill this out for your mother, to my mother? Mm. And it just occurred to me, you know, as my mother did this, did this clerical duty, um, my grandmother was confiding quietly to me, to me about her life and how she desired to um, end her life. And the, the, the ridiculous ox, oxymoronic parallel between what my mother was doing, mm. asking her, would you like turkey or chicken, and my grandmother actually saying, I want to leave this world. Um, it was a, an amazing moment and I, I had to try and commit it to paper. Yeah, I read that probably four or five years ago, that, that book and that story stuck in my mind. I actually went back and read it, reread it last night. Mm. And just the, yeah, the eerie juxtaposition between the mundane uh, task of filling out this form and your mother making demonstrative big ticks mm. for certain choices on the menu and your grandmother leaning against your shoulder and just whispering, I want to go. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, that's pretty close to what happened um, and you know, the, the, I didn't. You, you don't understand often something you write until much later. And I, it did occur to me much later that, you know, the story was dealing with re- pr- pretty big, the biggest of issues. And um, and it's 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 also about um, communication, and it's about what is said and what is not said, and what is meant and what is not meant, and how we can constantly misread. Mm-hmm. Um, what other people are saying to us. So, yeah, it was it, 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 of all my short stories, it's probably one of my favourite. Why did you write about it? Um, it's a very personal matter. It's something that you could have just kept to yourself. Well, that's true. But, um, you know, when, when, when you experience something in life and, as a, and you're a writer, um, and it's something that hits you so profoundly. You do, I think, off the first bat, you, as I said earlier, you want to make sense of that moment. So uh, that's a selfish thing, but it's also a part of of one's um, vocation. That's what writing is. You want you. The first selfish ideal is I want to try and purify this and simplify this, hmm. so I can see it more clearly. In my mind, and the second, the second duty is um, to experience to 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 bring that to the table for other people to experience. Mm. I mean, anybody reading that story can't fully ever understand what I found and what went through my mind seriously. Um, but on a second level, I can give them an impression. And, and, and I can attempt to connect with them through the universal. So, but I don't think, you know, I don't think um, writers are waiting for something to happen to them and then they rush off and say, look at me and look what happened to me and this is what happened to me. Mm-hmm. 
by any stretch because what I felt which was so powerful and personal uh, is simply what you, you hope gives the writing something extra hmm. and I mean let's be frank that's that's what we do and if other people can read that and feel feel what what are, what are my, my I think primary preoccupations in my work which you don't you can't grasp until you've done several pieces and you go aha now I understand what I'm playing around here yeah and that is um, a preoccupation with the pa- passage of time um, certainly life and death mm. um, and about about holding on to a moment um, which you will never hold on to but at least attempting to arrest time mm. to try and slow everything down so that you can see and feel more completely and I think that's a theme that, it, that comes up in a, um, a large amount of my work hmm. that story ticking was that first published in the Lulu Magnet uh, from memory I think it it I'm not sure. I think it was. Did you show it to anyone in your family prior to publication? No. Did you get any feedback on it? No. I don't even know if my mother's read it. Yeah, right. Um, or my father has read it. Um, as I said earlier, they have viewed my career as, um, as a, a part-time preoccupation. Still? Still. Wow. So... Um, you were one of well, Australia's th- most renowned writers. Well, things have changed a little bit with the Lewis books because, um, much much to my joy but surprise, that they have commanded a large audience. So um, that is a that has caught my parents' attention, and and um, they they have shown and expressed some pride in those books because people are constantly asking them about them. And, oh. But before, with the novels, I think with the with the fiction, it was incomprehensible to them, and uh, it was pointless. And mm. uh, why is he? Why is he? Why is a, ma- um, a, a man of his age making up stories? You know, mm-hmm. sort of that sort of naive view. Yeah. But when it's non-fiction and it's and it's real and people are talking about them, um, it's garnered their attention. But. You know, I gave up on on doing stuff to please my parents a very, very long time ago because mm. I learned the hard way. Yeah. And the hard way was when my first novel was published, and some things were taken from my from family history. Uh, my parents re- both read that book. I gave it to them. We popped some champagne. I went to bed. The next morning I was woken up at around 5 a.m. by my mother and father, my mother crying and saying, you have destroyed our life and you will embarrass us in front of our friends because of what you've revealed in this book. Which was fiction. Which was fiction. So um, from that moment on, there was there has never been, um, um, for me, um, a, a joy or a celebration with my work, with my family. Uh, it's now just, I do it, and that's it. So it's unfortunate, but it's slowly crept back a little bit with the non-fiction books, but that's taken 15 books and 20, uh, 25 plus years of publishing. Did you struggle to find peace with that? Was that a long process? Oh, I was very disappointing, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and on some level, you know, you want you want your own parents to be to be happy with your achievements. So um, that sort of went out the window with my first book. And and it's a long story I won't get into, but there's been other incidents with other books that um, that haven't been pleasant in relation to my family, even though they have nothing to do with family history. I mean, I've you know I've moved on a, a long way from. Um, the need to recycle old family stories for fiction mm. and indeed I haven't done written any fiction since I published The Trout Opera in 2007 so mm. that was incredibly eight years ago yeah just to take another few steps back mm. who were your earlier writing influences do you remember the first authors or 
writer's work that you read that made you sit up and think, this is amazing? Well, when I was a kid, I, um, I mean, when I, I'm talking in my early teens, you know, I loved the best-selling writers of the era and, and the pop boilers and I loved thrillers and war books and, and, um, but then my father gave me a copy of, um, 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 the, the famous goon show scripts and, um, then I started becoming really interested in, in satire and, um, and I remember when I was a, a little boy, I would, I would write and compile and staple together and make my own books. And some of those books were, I would, I would cut out an image from a magazine and then I would put a pithy caption. And I, I look back on that now and see it as quite um, sweet, but it was really me trying to look at something and interpret it in a different way. Mm. And I did that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Mm. So it was an. It, I look back on it now, and it was an interesting thing to do, mm. to try and see something in a different way, which of course is part and parcel of being a novelist. So you were an editor of these unpublished books, as it were. That's at, right. At a young age. <laughs> do you still have those books? Somewhere? They're in the National Library, actually. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Hundreds of them. No, not hundreds. <laughs> It'd be about eight huh. or nine of oh. those little books. I'll have to go and check them out. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I would do, draw cartoon strips and stuff like that as well. But it, then I would get into really bad rhyming couplet poetry and then I got into really long non-rhyming poetry, which in, in essence were warm-ups for a short story. Hmm. And then I started writing a short story called The Motorcycle Cafe, which um, just kept going. And then when I had about 10,000 words, I went, okay, this is something else. Mm. Were you submitting your work to magazines, publishers, trying to get published at it? Yeah, uh, well, it, I was published in a number of little magazines and um, um, Bruce Pascoe was publishing his Australian short stories little beautiful little productions and I got a, a couple of stories in there and then there was an advertisement in the newspaper actually for submissions for a new collection of Queensland fiction short fiction edited by Susan Johnson whom I work with yes, today yes. and I just plucked a chapter from the book I was writing the motorcycle cafe and they agreed to publish it hmm. and that was a hardback and out of that acceptance UQP phoned me and said do you have any more stories and I'd, I'd at that stage probably written about 10 drafts of what w would become the motorcycle cafe mm. and I said yeah I've got about another 15 and um, I showed it to them and they published it Wow! so that's how that happened right taking you back to the petrol station job you yeah. did that for about a year. Yeah. What did you take out of that? What did you learn about people from that job? Uh, an enormous amount, and not, not all of it was good. Um, during my lunch hours, I wrote my book. Mm. But during my shifts, um, you know, so I had I'd graduated from uni. I was writing a book. What did you study at uni? Um, journalism and English Lit. So I was doing all that, but here I was pumping petrol, and um, I learned very quickly that people make um, instantaneous surface judgments of you. I was treated like crap. Hmm. I was sworn at. I was made fun of. Uh, and after a few weeks, the boss of the station said, um, um, how are you going? And I said, oh, it's, you know, it's not what I expected. And he said, mate, um, this is what you call working with the public. This is it. And he was right. Mm. And it took me back in a way to understanding great, uh, in a greater way my grandmother and her work as a cleaner for the wealthy families of Brisbane and gave me a real, it, it, it gave me a real um, appreciation for um, um, 
for menial work, for people who, who perform that work, and um, solidified in me certainly um, um, a political persuasion as well. Hmm. So it was very, very beneficial in hindsight. Uh, but um, it is amazing how, when you're at the coal face, to understand how people treat other people. Hmm. It's astonishing. You were writing in your lunch hours. I, mm. I'm guessing that was a solitary activity. You'd take yourself away from yeah. others just to do so. Yeah, I mean, the, the station was attached to a, to a car dealership and a garage, and, um, and I would just go into the mechanic's lunchroom. So I was writing about mechanics and working class people, and I was surrounded by them. Mm. And I, th- I think some of that got into into the stories. I mean, it had to. Mm. You know, it was my immediate experience. Did anyone there take any interest in what you were doing? No, but funnily enough, they were that they'd sort of you know the guys would make sort of make a joke of it, but it was just a, a um, just a niggle. It wasn't. You know, who does this guy think he is? They were actually really supportive. Oh, right. Yeah. Hmm. So there was no camaraderie among the colleagues? Yeah. It was more the public who were taking a dim view? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Do you think that dim view of petrol station attendants uh, persists? Well, the thing was that they, uh, that they would, the people would come in to be served and I was the servant. Hmm. And so the immediate assumption is that, um, um, that that's my lot in life and that's who I am and um, I'll treat that person accordingly you know without even understanding to any nth degree well that wasn't the full story in fact um, there's a there's a lot of other stuff going on and um, um, but whatever you know that's the way people are we instantly judge and condemn we instantly pigeonhole and slot and uh, to the point of, of you know, I, I remember some men that came in were so arrogant and so condescending mm. and demeaning um, that it really opened my eyes. Mm. So tell me about university. You studied journalism and English? English literature, yeah. And um, look, that was just, uh, you know, I, don't, I didn't... I didn't have many class contact hours and that was an opportunity three years to think and read and write basically mm. and um, to just to get just to immerse yourself in that space without and to have a level of independence and you know, it took it took a while to understand that well actually I can actually do what I want I can actually go there when I want at what time I want mm. The transition from school is quite interesting where you still you come into that first year of uni and you're still tethered to your prior um, re- regimes and routines and so yeah it takes a bit of a while to get a handle on freedom I mm. guess mm. Um, but it was a wonderful time in that I read really widely and um, I started I, I wrote fiction for Semper the magazine and got about f- maybe five or six stories published over the three years hmm. there. And in the meantime, I was um, writing and rewriting and rewriting The Motorcycle Cafe. Why so many drafts? How did you have the sense that it wasn't quite there yet? So you, you wouldn't have had an editor at that stage. It just wasn't pleasing you, was that the case? No, I think it was, ex- I mean, it was extremely pleasing. I don't think I wanted to let it go. Hmm. Um, and it was the happiest, the happiest experience of my writing career because I was, I was, I didn't know, I didn't know what I was doing <laughs> technically. Um, I had no audience. I had no expectations from publishers. Uh, I was absolutely free. And I rewrote it because I wanted to polish it and polish it and make it as hard as a diamond, basically. <laughs> And um, I look back at it now, and it's very, very clean and spare. And, um, it's about as good as a kid of that age could have gotten it. Hmm. Published in 1988, I believe you were around 26 at the time. Yep. What did it feel like to see your work in book form? 
It was incredible. I mean, I was, I was in, I was travelling in London, and it was sent to me in London, and um, it was, uh, you know, it was one of those days in your life hmm. that you never forget. Hmm. It was pretty amazing. What happened next? Um, I got to work on another book. You had the deal with the same publisher? You with the in? same publisher, yeah. And um, I think it's a, it's a bit of a mess, that book, but um, it was published in the UK and published here. And it was a difficult thing to write, as the second novel always is. Some people never get past that. Mm. Um, that barrier uh, but I got through that and that was fine and um, published a third novel with UQP um, none of these sold very well I, I, Motorcycle Cafe was reprinted once but um, you know it didn't set the world on fire mm-hmm. let's put it that way did you have any expectations of that sort no I had a, no idea yeah. I had no idea of the publishing game or uh, what people wanted or mm. didn't want well the fact that you got three contracts in a row meant that you're doing something right I suppose yeah I guess they were the days though too in publishing where publishers would invest in a writer in that they would go well look this first one shows a lot of promise mm. they might hit their straps on the fourth or the fifth book so it's like a like a poker machine you know if we keep going with this person we might get three cherries in a row mm. but they were committed Publishers were committed to younger writers and to nurturing and seeing if if they didn't hit the jackpot down the track. And I don't think that exists anymore. Hmm. When did journalism enter the picture for you? Look, I figured out at uni that um, if I was going to survive the writing life, I would have to work. Journalism was writing in a sense it could teach me a lot Mm. it has taught me an enormous amount still does to this day so um, I hooked onto a cadetship at the Gold Coast Bulletin and um, thinking one day when I sell enough copies of my books I'll give this away and I'm still there (laughs) (laughs) tell me about that cadetship your first day your first week oh the my characters God. you met oh, it was unbelievable and you know you, you face this row of old sub-editors smoking and um, and they're shouting at you and barking at you and um, they throw you into the deep end when you're young when you first in they still do it they still do it here at Queensland newspapers but and they throw you onto what the hardest and toughest rounds and that's the police round mm. so you go from being a coddled university student to attending a fatal motorcycle accident where the rider's head is still in the helmet. Wow. And it's shocking. And you see, I remember, you know, going to murder scenes and one particular young boy was stabbed with a um, paper spike and I can still see that sticking out of his back. And, you know, you've, you're, thr- you're thrown absolutely against the cliff wall. And you you have you learn you have to learn pretty quickly. I learned more in the first month of my job than I did in three years at uni. No question. Mm. What kept you there on that tough round? Uh, well, it fascinated me. Um, uh, you know, it's an extreme. It's it's the extremes of human behaviour, um, which is uh, unendingly um, fascinating to a writer. And to a human being, um, and there are old crime pr- crime reporters who would tell stories and about the old days of police and corruption. And, and I only think I only realise now that my fasc- my fascination with true crime it's, it it began there, and then I'd forgotten about it, hmm. and it reignited with this latest project. Yeah. Do you think that you're Journalism work complements your fiction, or vice versa. Absolutely, um, I'm a great. I have a great belief that what I learn in this job, and you never stop learning in journalism, mm-hmm. because every situation that you um, work on is different. 
some will bear similarities yearly cycles events but every scenario is new and you're constantly meeting people for the first time so you're always learning Hmm. ways to approach ways to break down somebody to get to the truth ways to elicit emotion with your interviews how do you you know the art of a great interview um, is an extraordinary art and how do you know when you 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 never fully learn it which is wonderful and it's great to have a job where you can come in and go there's something fresh is going to happen today Mm. and that's what's kept me in it without question and certainly necessity that one has to earn a living yeah I want to ask about that has your your journalism work has that been a way to subsidise or to fund your your book writing so those two things run in parallel yeah I mean I couldn't I mean I've never been able to not have a full time job I mean I've had grants and literature board grants and wonderful pockets of little vacuums of intense creative work um but then as you get older and, you know, as, as happens to all of us, you, you have a house and you have children and um, uh, there, is, there is no alternative to a full-time position. Mm. You have to make, you have to create your creative time around all of that. It doesn't mm. hover around it. You have to fit it around the big machine. Mm. And... Um, you either work out how to do that or you forget it because there is simply uh, there's no uh, degree of sort of oh, I've sort of got it right or not you either get it right or you don't hmm. because life consumes you and you've got to work out how to fit you your own stuff around that and you know it takes a bit of a bit of time to do that and I think my um, my approach to my work and how I create has changed to suit the circumstances. So I think now I can, I've trained myself to, if I've only got an hour or an hour and a half, I can actually get into that zone really quickly Hmm. and absolutely maximize those minutes that I have available. In the past, I could, I could be luxuriant and I could sit back and go, well, I've got all day. Yeah. Why do I have to bother with that? But now, everything is focused. It's like concentrate. And it has to be. You have to use it every second. And then you're thrown off it into life again. Mm. So, um, and I think um, I'm quite proud of how I've worked that out for myself. Mm. Tell me about your career as a tabloid journalist. Do you work for the Daily Telegraph in Sydney? No, I didn't. I worked. I worked for um, when I went from the Gold Coast Bulletin. I went to the Courier Mail, which was then a broadsheet. Uh-huh. Then I moved to Sydney in um, 19, end of 1986, and I worked on the Sun Herald, which is a Sunday Fairfax tabloid. Mm. And I worked on there for a number of years, but I've contributed f- freelance-wise for everyone from the Telegraph to the Herald Sun to the Age, um, you name it. Hmm. You refer to that period in the Lulu Magnet, this may have been, I don't know, artistic license as Hacktown? Yeah, well, that was just uh, really a limp attempt at a joke. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Why do you think people talk to journalists? Um, Even if they say they don't, People, human beings, are compelled to tell their stories. People love nothing more than to talk about themselves. And, you know, I've, I've tried to get interviews with people and said, oh, absolutely, I will not. I refuse to speak to you. And within five minutes, they're off. And four hours later, you leave. <laughs> and um, it is just something innate in the bulk of us. Uh, it is a sharing of experience. Um, it can be an attempt to hide and conceal. There are so many motivations. Mm-hmm. I couldn't list them. but um, um, And there are some journalists who, without even a, before even opening their mouths, people can sense that they're good listeners. And to me, that is the primary 
one of the primary tools of journalism mm. is to be a great listener and do not in interrupt and do not interject with your own theories just be patient and let them talk mm. and be interested and people will lay their heart on the table if you're a great listener and to be a writer you have to be a great listener because that's that's the bulk of our material it's everywhere it's mm. around us it's what's happening around us mm. and you have to be attuned tune in and pick it up mm. and pull it out and put it on the page mm. so it sounds simplistic but you know there are some people that you talk to and they are, you they are absolutely not listening to you all they are waiting for is a break where they can interject and tell you what's on their mind. And those people never learn anything because mm. they can't listen. They're incapable of listening. Mm. So um, that's why people talk to journalists, you know. Mm -hmm. Can you put your finger on anything else that you've learned about people through journalism? Oh boy. Um, where do I begin? It is the great, it's the greatest, uh, I feel that it's the greatest privilege when people let you into their lives for the purposes of a magazine feature or whatever. And you really have to respect that. I mean, it's a great honour. And it doesn't matter who it is or where they are on the ladder of life. You know, for someone... I, I did an interview with a guy for one of, one of my book, um, these non fiction true crime books um, late last year uh, a man called John Stopford who has had a hell of a life he was one of the whistleblowers on the Moonlight State Four Corners Moonlight State by Chris Masters and played a very big role historically in in this state and would and he I mean the police went for him hunted for him after that and his life has been a wreck his health is terrible he's a former heroin addict he lives modestly, to, to put it mildly. And I rang John Stopford and said, can I come and see you? And he said, yeah, you can come. And he welcomed me into his home and made me a cup of instant coffee and told me his tortuous tale of his life. And you go, that's the ultimate. You know, that man let me in mm. and he's told me the truth. So I have to honour that. I honour that with the way I, I write him up in the book. And um, that's the deal, you know. Hmm. But it's a, it's a privilege, this job. Hmm. Your journalism, since I've come to know it in the last few years, has always struck me as having a very authoritative and a definitive voice, as in, this is what happened. It's, it's kind of coming from on high, like this kind of very strong voice. I wonder how you developed that. Um, you know, as I intimated before, the job changes. It, it's, there's something fresh and new all the time. But I think my writing, my journalism has changed I indeed in the last few years. Um, and I guess that comes, that voice comes from um, developing a degree of confidence. And you can't get that overnight. And it comes with years and years and years and years of work, I think. And, you know, I was the most unconfident, shy, timid child. And my father forced me to do for, uh, debating when I was at school. And I hated it. I feared it. I counted down the days and the hours to the debate. I was so terrified. And I did that for years and then Almost overnight, one day, it turned over and clicked in, hmm. and I'd, I'd learned some confidence. Now, it's the same in journalism. Um, it takes many, many years of experience and encounters with other people and trying to write in a different way and trying to write um, in a way that, no one, no, that no, no, none of your other journalists are writing, perhaps, how can I illuminate this situation and how can I make this re real? And all of that accretes um, to the point where you get to, I think, you, you would hope so, that you, you develop your own voice. 
And, you know, I've still got an enormous amount to learn about feature writing. Hmm. I'm still learning it. And, um, but I guess, you know, it's just logic that you can, that you begin to, to get your own voice. And, you know, yeah, by getting your own voice, I mean that, you know, with my fiction, I've had periods where, I, where my, my work has been very florid. But now as I get older, I'm trying to strip everything, strip it all back, mm -hmm. back, 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 to get, to get it hard and pure and clear. And I think this is what the non-fiction work over the last few years has taught me. Hmm. When did Q Weekend magazine enter your career? Well, I was sort of faffing around freelancing and on, on literature board grants and so on and so forth. Through, um, I was in Sydney, I left Sydney in about 2002, 2003, drifted up here, sort of towards home. Um, my then, my partner, who's my wife now, um, fell pregnant. And I thought, oh shit, um, I have to get a job. So I contacted the then editor, David Fagan of the Korean Mail, because I knew David from my first era at the Korean Mail in the 1980s. Mm. And he was now the ed editor in chief. And uh, I, I met, met and had a coffee with him. And he said, um, what do you want? And I said, well, I need a job. He said, well, what can you give me? What are you going to bring to the table? Mm. And I said, anything you want. I mean, I can write colour, I can write features, I can write news, I can write, you know, whatever you want, but I need a job. <laughs> and he said, start next month. So that was in February 2005, and there was very strong talk even then about a magazine for the paper. And I did some regular work for the newspaper until about July 2005. The magazine was locked down. It was going to be published in October. 2005 so I started full-time work on it in July 2005 and uh, wow it was I just came along at, by chance at the right time and I've been there ever since yeah you edited for a time yeah yeah tell, tell me about that um, I enjoyed it I learned an enormous amount but I hated the administrative side, I hated the marketing side, I hated meeting with, with, with those executives to justify existence and I hated the talk of ads and money and mm. revenue. I just wanted to put some great stories mm. in the magazine and I think we did some, we, we did some great work, I mean you were part of that. but. Um, in the end, I was told the landscape, the media landscape was changing rapidly and that things were changing in, in the company and that um, um, staff were going to be fewer and um, the budget was going to be smaller. And they said, what do you want to do? Do you want to go forward with that? Or I said, I want to go back and write. That's what I love to do. Mm. And they said, great, do it. So. It was a f fascinating period, but um, I much prefer where I am. Yeah, one thing that you uh, taught me as editor during that time was you described um, how to write an ending to a feature as bringing a plane into land. Yeah. And I still to this day think of that when I'm writing endings, like how can I bring the plane into land? Yeah, so that's right. Thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Did you learn anything from that time that has since fed into your writing or your, your water life, that kind of uh, intersection between commerce? Yeah, and yeah. I mean, the, what I learned, um, the great thing was pr proofreading the magazine. So you're looking at features written by other people in a completely different way. You're not just a regular reader. You're examining structure. You're examining quotes. Um, you're examining um, facts or lack thereof. And... It really took me in, inside the mechanics of a feature story in a way that I had never thought before. So I was right deeply inside it. Mm. And to come out now and to be writing again and with that knowledge I picked up is tremendous. Mm. It just adds, I think, another level to what I learn about this business. Mm. 
getting towards the end, Matt, when did the idea for Three Crooked Kings enter your mind? Well, for good or ill, it was an, it was it landed in my lap. Um, I'd finished the Child Opera, I'd published Brisbane, and I, I re- this was the end of two thousand and nine. I was ready to write a novel. Bear in mind, this was um, six years ago. I wanted to write a novel about um, the war historian Charles Bean, not at Gallipoli, but but on the mission he took back to the peninsula in 1919 mm. to gather artefacts for the Australian War Memorial. And I thought, that's a great story. That's the birth of the Anzac myth. Mm. I'm going to write that novel. And then a mate of mine, Doug Hall, um, had been communicating with Terry Lewis, the former police commissioner. Lewis's wife had just died in 2009, and Lewis proclaimed to Doug he was ready to do his book, The Terry Lewis Story. And would Doug write it for him or help him write it? And Doug said, I can't for personal reasons, but you might want to meet my mate, Matt. So Doug and I went out to Lewis's then residence at uh, Winton Street in Upper up, um, Stafford. And we sat down and I thought, I was thinking, I was looking at Lewis sitting on this big old floral couch, looking at him across the coffee table. And I thought, oh God, um, if I accept this, this is going to eat up years of my life, years. Mm. But then I went away and thought about it and I thought, if I don't do this, I'll always regret it. Mm. So I agreed to start talking with Lewis through 2010 and the ambition was to write a single volume. But then he produced enormous amounts of paperwork and also, through the period of our interviews, which extended beyond three years, I was waiting for him to tell me the truth. And I gave him three years opportunity to do it. And he didn't do it. Hmm. So then my dilemma was, um, um, how, do I, how do I do these books? By then it was, I thought it's not more than one book. And I started writing and I had to be true to what I've learned as a journalist. And I went obviously outside of Lewis in that first year and I interviewed dozens and then that became hundreds and then I kind of, I've lost count of how many people I've interviewed. Um, and then there's all the documentation and um, I thought, well, I've got enough material for five books and I'm just gonna have to stay true to myself and write them as best I can, as closest to the truth as I can. Mm. And uh, Lewis, with the second volume, was very upset about that and cut off, cut off ties with me in April last year. And since then, there has been a rolling, mounting um, and orchestrated campaign against me, my work, my reputation, the books. Um, and it's going to continue until the third volume is published and probably beyond that. Mm. So it's fascinating. It's not what I anticipated in terms of a backlash from a cabal of old police officers um, trying to block, censure, stop this story from returning to the surface. And I think they all thought it was dead and buried. And um, now that it's back, they don't like it. They don't like it because these men are, and and I'm talking police, I'm talking ex-gangsters, I'm talking all of them. They're in their 70s and 80s, and this is legacy time. This is, I want to to continue to be seen as as tough and kind and good to my children and my grandchildren. And I was a great police officer, and I was in there for 40 years, and this is what I did, and... Uh, and now these books are coming out and they're finding granddads in the index and they're going, hang on a sec, what did granddad do in 1974? Why did he do that? Uh, what, what was that story? And this is what they're hating, that their past is back to haunt them. And they're not happy either because it's, and it's, it's a point that Nigel Powell, the former policeman, actually made to me early in the piece. And he said, look, 
these books are potentially very dangerous. And I said, I don't understand that because all I'm doing is assembling the narrative and writing it as a nar proper narrative. And he said, well, that's my point. You're joining the dots. No one's ever done that. Mm. I mean, if you read the Fitzgerald Inquiry um, transcripts, for example, um, you know, one day they'll be talking about 1957 and the next day about 1987 and then the next day about 1977. So there's no timeline. It, it goes back and forward and back and forward. And um, these books are the first major attempt to put everything in sequence. So, as Nigel explained, they're dangerous because people now can understand why one thing led to another thing led to another thing. Why that happened and that happened and that happened. And I'd never thought of it in those terms. Mm -hmm. My my ambition simply was to, to approach this as an epic novel. And these are all the characters, mm -hmm. but all of this actually happened. Right. So that was my, my light bulb idea at the beginning of the trilogy. Is that how you pitched it to the publisher? No, I didn't even I didn't even have an understanding of how I would write it until well into the interviews with Terry Lewis. Right. Yeah. Well, how much did you have when you did show it to a publisher or show the idea to a publisher? I had one page. All right. And I said, look, this guy's never spoken at length. He's now in his early 80s. Um, he wants to talk. This is a great book for Queensland. Do you want to do it? And that was it. And they said, they said, sure, mate. Yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> but, you know, to their credit, uh, I mean, a trilogy of non-fiction true crime has never been done before in mm -hmm. Australia. So it was an incredible leap of faith by the publishers to publish the first, knowing the story's not complete, mm -hmm. to publish the second, still knowing the story's not complete and that this would be a bridge book to the third book. So it was a really big punt. Mm -hmm. And you know you you get you're diving into the dark here because no one's there's no statistical evidence of whether this would actually ever work. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, the readers have hung in. So, yeah. Has it been a challenge to fit these books around your work here at the paper? Yeah, it has. And but I've had the greatest support from my editors here, and um, um, they. Well, starting with David Fagan and Michael Crutcher and then followed through by their replacements, Christopher Dore and Peter Gleeson. Those four men have permitted me to, if I have moments at work where I can, downtime at work, I can do my own stuff. And in exchange for that, they get extracts and all of this sort of stuff. So it's worked very well for both of us, and particularly for me, otherwise I would never have been able to write the books in the pace that I have written them. Mm. And I'm very, very grateful for that. Do you have like a room at your house that's just dedicated to folders and documents and files related to this book project? Because it's just an enormous amount of information you've had to vacuum up and then uh, make sense of. Yeah, well, the, the vast bulk of my important files are here mm. at work. Right. And also I have one of the greatest newspaper libraries in Australia at my fingertips, which is just down the corridor and there's everything there. Mm. So it makes sense that the bulk of the writing has been done in here. And and it's a secure environment as yes. well. Well, you were right when you looked across the coffee table at Terry Lewis <laughs> and thought this is going to take years. I predicted five, and it's now at almost five and a half. Yeah. So it'll probably extend to six. But there are other books that are, are potentially waiting to be done out of these books. That's very fascinating. So you haven't been discouraged or you haven't felt the enormity of this project. You're instead inspired to look to the next big thing. Well, they've thing. just been generated by research and by meeting people. Hmm. And, you know, this has been the hardest thing I've ever done. And should I continue in this genre, I'm not sure because um, it's been hell. I mean, it's really been difficult. And... Uh, but uh, there's a parallel excitement in finding people and, you know, the chase and track tracking them down and getting mm -hmm. new material and, I mean, that's just irreplaceable. So it's exciting, but physically this has been really wearing um, because it's been, it has quite literally been, since I started writing Three Crooked Kings, it has literally been over three years of non-stop work and I mean 
working through my annual leave for three years. Mm. So I haven't had a break in over three years um, just because of the, the, the publishing schedule. So I think w- with that off my back and a little bit more time up my sleeve, I could begin to enjoy, you know, looking at old murders and talking to old gangsters and all the other books that are what, queued up waiting to be done. Well, once it goes off to the publisher, you should have a well-earned break. Yeah, I mean, the thing too, with the, not that I'm complaining, but I'm not, but the thing too with these books is that it's they generate... Uh, um, uh, the, the speaking schedule is is monstrous. Mm. I mean, people want to hear their story, this story. Yeah. You've done a lot of library speaking Oh, gigs it's just been incre- state, right? incredible. I mean, I did one at... I mean, this is between books, you know, yeah. at Jackson Jokers came out last April. I did a gig in February at North Lakes in their beautiful new library up there. And it was like over 250 people there. Wow. And you go, I've got nothing to flog to you. I'm in between books here. But, you know, elderly Queenslanders and and young, yeah, some young ones too, but they are, they lived through this. This was their life. So they want to discuss it and they want to hear about it. And um, that has blown my mind, the, the actual public interest in the story. I just want to end with the quote that I noted down from the Lulu Magnet last night. You'd be surprised at how frank men can be at urinals. <laughs> <laughs> Any further comments to add on that, Matt? Uh, yes, there's one comment. I forgot I'd even written that. <laughs> <laughs> but urinals aren't my, one of my primary themes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Pleasure, mate. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Penmanship. And I should have mentioned previously, you can find show notes to all of the episodes at penmanshippodcast.com. I include a timeline for each episode featuring quotes and links to any writing or events discussed during the conversation. I welcome your feedback as ever, andrew at penmanshippodcast.com. I'd love to hear your suggestions for who you think I should interview. If you like what you hear in this podcast and you'd like to support it, the best way you can do that is to share it with people in your life who love great Australian writing. You can rate the podcast on iTunes. You can share it on social media. That's all for now. Until next time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.